So I'm going to speak to you about a topic that I'm super passionate about, which is product market fit. Um, out of interest, show of hands, who works in marketing here? OK, good number. And who works in product? OK. Who's a founder? OK. And who, who works in tech or tech? And then we'll do sales. OK, we have a real mix. OK, fine. Fine. So basically, I'm going to walk you through the journey we went on last year at Spoke to effectively achieve 20% month-on-month growth while striving for product market fit. So first of all, what is Spoke? Spoke, if you don't know, is the app that produces music to help you relax and feel positive. We're effectively at Spoke trying to help Gen Z attach and relate to mindfulness. Um, and that is the journey of Spoke that we're trying to do. I was head of growth at Spoke. I'm no longer head of growth at Spoke. Um, I actually left at the end of December to start my own growth consultancy, um, basically helping early stage apps find product market fit. However, I'm still representing the Spoke team. So shout out to Spoke. So another question, and this is pure curiosity, who would say in this room that they have, without a shadow of a doubt, achieved product market fit? No one. <laughs> OK, so then let's do the inverse. Hands up who doesn't think they have product market fit. OK, so most people just don't care. Fine. <laughs> That's fine. Let's keep going. So the first challenge I want to highlight is one that we struggled with a lot, and I think pretty much all startups now will be, but specifically pre-product market fit startups, which is going for what investors want to see versus what the business needs. Now, it sounds kind of like, oh, aren't they just one and the same? Not really. If you're post-product market fit, you're going for revenue, you're going for growth, you're going for profitability, great, easy stuff. But if you're pre-product market fit, you're not going for those things. But investors still want to see those things, right? So you've got to battle with, do we focus on product engagement, retention, or do we you know, pour users top of funnel? And the problem is, if you pour users top of funnel, you're effectively building your house on the sand if you don't have good retention. Like the last talks, the panel that we just had, have all been going on about retention. It is seriously important. And what we found was that we didn't want to build our house on sand, we wanted to actually build a mansion, right? So that's challenge number one. The second challenge, bruh, um, is the budget that we had in marketing in April of last year was 3,000 pounds. The budget that we had in December last year was 3,000 pounds. We're talking about how we achieved 20% month-on-month growth with a budget of 3,000 pounds that didn't move, OK? Now, this is a pretty big challenge. I don't know if anyone's done that. It's not impossible to do. But it basically means that you can't rely on just pour more money into paid. Just turn on a new channel. Oh, we've got Meta kind of working. Let's try TikTok. If you do that, you're going to need to spend more so it won't work. OK, so these are the two challenges that we were facing. So what did we achieve? For those of you who said that you not sure if you've got product market fit. There's a pretty big survey. It's like the benchmark for product market fit, which is asking your users, how disappointed would you be if you could no longer use enter product name? The benchmark is 40%. If 40% of your users say, I'd be really disappointed, then you've got product market fit. We went from 31% to 53.3%. Okay? We did, throughout the year, maintain 20% month-on-month growth to active users. Emphasis on active users, OK? Hold that thought, because we're going to come back to that one. We reduced cost per install 78.8%. I know what you're thinking. Oh my gosh, you get 12p installs? No. We were paying a ridiculous amount for installs before. We cut that down. And the final thing is a flat retention curve. Now, a flat retention curve is another really great indicator of product market fit, because it means that people stick around, right? So that's what we did. And now the question really is, how did we do it? Oh, yeah, this slide. This is the wall of reviews. This is like Spoke Hall of Fame. I mean, if you haven't seen the app, check it out, because it's always a 5 or 4.9 star rating, 350 reviews. Ooh. So how did we do it? This is what we did. Number one, we went for low-hanging fruit. Okay? I, there's no silver bullet to what I'm about to say. There's no secret hack. Right? I'm not big on hacks. I'm not big on the term growth hack. 
only when I'm jesting. Um, however, what we did do is be super, super consistent with the process that we followed. And the first thing that we looked at was, OK, well, what's an easy win? Right? Like, what's super easy? Now, if you know a lot about mindfulness apps, you know that sometimes they cater for a lot of jobs to be done or a lot of needs. Spoke, for example, can help you energize. It can help you get to sleep. It can help you focus. It can help you reduce stress. Like, that's an awful lot of things it can help you do. So the first thing we did was slice and dice the user base and think, OK, who is using the product in what way? How are they retaining? Are there any signs of activation or even further up? Like, are there any signs on their first use of the app that indicate, yes, this looks like we should focus here? And what we found is that sleepers were super, super great for us. Now, we also obsessed over the customer problem. Now, I, mentioned, now I just mentioned sleep, right? Sleep is a problem. If you can't sleep, that's pretty suckish, right? So it needs to be fixed. We obsessed around sleep from like May of last year, speaking to everyone, like asking them that they're sleeping. We spoke to people who came to the app for focus and were like, yeah, but do you sleep? Do you spoke for sleep? We just went crazy, crazy, crazy for sleep. We repositioned the entire app on the App Store to be focused on sleep. And we did that like in a week. We didn't sit down and like have a massive debate. We were like, okay, the data kind of says sleep is good. For reference, we had like 65% retention at week 10 for our cohort of sleepers, right? So it was pretty impressive stuff. So we just thought, let's do it. The problem then comes that you don't just need to obsess over their problem, but their problem with you. And this is kind of what Leah was speaking about earlier, to be honest, which is you need to work on your product if they have a problem with your product. So we can obsess around their overall problem, sleep, but if we're not actually making changes when they're telling us what to do or giving us feedback, they're not going to stick around. So there were some pretty easy things we could do. Like we had this annoying, and I call it annoying. I don't want to get stoned. There's spoker in the room. Um, there was this annoying ping sound at the end of completing your daily journey, which everyone hated. Right? It was like the number one complaint that we got on feedback. It was so easy to remove that ping. We removed it. No one ever again has complained about the ping. The sound now is really nice. Right? So you need to actually start to work on your product and remove the problems while still keeping a high-level overview of the key problem. Now, I want to point your attention to this. Data, conversations, action. I could have had another line underneath saying quantitative and qualitative, but I'm not a fan of so many words. Um, the reason this is important is because if you're pre-product market fit, you cannot just be in the numbers because reality is that you're going to be dealing with really small cohorts, you're not going to have statistical significance for your experiments, and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, we did something, we increased it 1%, let's, let's go. If anyone here is great at maths, by the way, get your calculator out and just like work out that if you increase 100 by 1% for 52 weeks of the year, see what you get. It's not impressive. 1% incremental growth to zero is still zero. Right? So if you're small, you can't be focusing on, oh, let's do a small tweak, let's do that. Which means that when you're looking at things to prioritize, you have to take that into account. So we followed a data, conversations, action framework, which is, what does the data say? This can tell us what's happening. Right? Oh, we can see that we're losing people at this portion of the app. And then we would try and speak to them. Super hard to speak to people who don't like you, by the way. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to get a customer interview call with someone that doesn't like, even sign up. It's not possible because you don't have their details. And if you try and get it with people who've signed up but not used your app, still super, super hard because they don't actually care. But you still have to try and figure it out, whether that's in person, asking your friend, your mum, whoever it is, like, get that feedback. Then you can act on it. So what? And that's the important point. So everyone, let's just have a moment and respect Mr. Tyson, OK? You're thinking, this guy. Trust this guy to pull up a picture of Mike Tyson at App Promotion Summit London. Why did he do that? I want this to be ingrained in your minds. Seriously, this is the most important slide of the entire presentation, if not the day. Because Mike Tyson represents the epitome of brutality. Right? He's the most brutal guy. It doesn't matter how many people in here are going to be unicorn founders. If Mike Tyson walks in and says, that's my seat, you're going to move. Right? You're going to move. Sorry, Mike. And we took this to mean something. Brutal prioritization. 
right? As brutal as Mike, which means that sometimes you come up with an idea you're super excited about, and everyone else is like, no, that's bad. And you just have to accept that, right? Brutal. We haven't got time to be like, no, it's a really great idea. Come back with another one. It's like, you just got to know, like, look, that, that's bad. Or test it. But we were really brutal with prioritization. And the important thing is, while talking about the marketing budget, we had to kind of share resources across product and marketing, which means that it's not just marketing prioritizing here, product prioritizing here. It's like, no, we're all going to prioritize based on what we think is going to have the biggest impact on what we're trying to do, which is get to product market fit. So one last second for Mike. Thank you. Now, I have a super controversial opinion, and I might get stoned by some of the astute growth people in the room, but I'm going to risk it anyway, which is basically this idea of validating something okay, before you go and do it. Now, I've been really, really thinking about this over the past six months and trying to just tear it to pieces, because there's times where you should do a small experiment, validate, see if it's moving in the right direction, and then take a big step forward. But when you're pre-product market fit, this can really, really slow you down. And also, you might not get the indication that you're looking for. And I think the best way I've come up with to summarize this is that water doesn't boil at 99 degrees. Like, if your goal is to boil water, if you turn the temperature up to 10 degrees, like you're not going to get an indication that it's working. Sure, I'm, I'm not a chemist, but maybe at some point, at some temperature, like it's a physicist rather, it starts to bubble. Maybe it bubbles at 100, and that's your indication, around 75. But point being, if you're trying to boil water, you've got to go to 100%. And that's the same thing with our prioritization. If we're prioritizing something, like let's say meta as a channel, we're not just taking meta and going like, to test a mediocre creative and then be like, oh, that didn't work, we're done. No, we're going to give everything we can to come up with the best creatives possible over a period of time to give all we have into that channel to get it to 100 degrees. And then if it fails, we stop. Right? So it's minimum viable test, but viable being the, the key word. So I want to conclude. Right? just for a second, with these. Number one, look for low-hanging fruit. Number two, obsess over the customer's problem. Number three, be absolutely brutal with your prioritization. And number four, commit to high-impact initiatives. And on this last point, I do want to say a little bit more, so let me pull back to the water slide. The reason being, when you're prioritizing for high-impact initiatives, it means that they're going to take a bit more time to do. Right? I'm sure we're all familiar with impact versus effort. Like, of course, we want to start with low-hanging fruit, low effort, but at some point, you're going to get to that point where you need to start prioritizing high-effort things, and you can't really run away from them. You need to just get stuck in and kind of work on them. So that is probably the biggest takeaway other than brutal prioritization. And yeah, that is my talk, guys. So problem solved. Problem solved. Right? You sold product market fit. And in fact, on that note, I will share one last tip, one last tip, which is sometimes the answer is staring at you right in the face, and you're just ignoring it. Right? And I'll give an example. I said that we went to fully focus on sleep. Right? We focused on sleep only for about three months, because sleep was not the route where we found product market fit. What happened was we focused on sleepers, were interviewing everyone, and realized that the male users of our app were really struggling with sleep. But the larger portion of female users on the app were not. They were using it for a variety of different reasons. And we set out on this mission to be the men's mental health app, but then also realized that there's a whole load of women on our app who really need help too. So we pivoted completely, but we pivoted really quickly. So sometimes it's staring at you right in the face, and you just need to accept that it's there, it's done, embrace it, and keep it calm. So if you are struggling with product market fit, Come talk to me. I love talking about all things product market fit. I do have charts and graphs. I, I can do that as well. <laughs> I just didn't put any up on the stage. So if you want charts and graphs, I'll send you some. But yeah, it's been great. Thank you.